Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Hello, you're listening to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. I'm Lisa Fine, and today I'm speaking with Jackie Cheslow, who's the director for Business at... See? Every time. Okay, take two. You're listening to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. I'm Lisa Fine, and today I'm speaking with Jackie Cheslow, who is the director, Business Ethics and Compliance and Information Management for Avis Budget. Avis Budget has approximately 30,000 employees in 180 countries. Jackie's been with Avis since 2007, starting her career there in records management and information. She is a great woman in compliance, not just because of her expertise, but how she welcomes new women into the field, has great advice, and it's always a pleasure when I get to see her. So, Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Lisa, thank you for having me and for your kind words. Uh, I'm really honored to be included in this series of podcasts because I get great value out of them myself. Well, thanks. Um, Can you talk a little bit about your evolution into your current role? You know, a lot of people come from a law or business background, and you started in records and information and then continued your learning and expertise throughout your career. Well, actually, like most people, I fell into compliance. I fell into records management. Um, I was a, a paralegal in a New York law firm and got hired by a small pharmaceutical company in New Jersey, and they had their first document production request. And I asked where the file room was. And they looked at me like I was crazy and sent me up to the storage area on the third floor. And that was the start of my record management career (laughs) because I was so floored by what I found when I went downstairs. My boss said to me, so fix it. So I learned how to do records management. (laughs) While at the same place, um, sovereign Zoxy went into play. Um, As you know, there was a lot of requirements from a compliance perspective around it. And I handled the legal compliance side. So I've done compliance for quite a while, but when the opportunity came up here at Avis, it was at that time strictly a record information management position. They didn't have a centralized compliance program, and it was distributed throughout the business. Different people handled different parts of the program. But we only had uh, corporate locations in four countries at the time, Canada, the U.S., Australia, and Argentina, none of them particularly complex from a a compliance perspective. Um, And and back then, as you know, I mean, even uh, FCPA wasn't a big issue for anybody. But as the business changed and the compliance environment changed, it became evident there was a bigger need for it. So working with the general counsel, we slowly began building out this program. And I've had this role now since 2010. Um, And as you said, it was learn as I go. Uh, there was a lot that was new to me here, um, particularly from an uh, international perspective. I had tons of experience domestically, but I, the company I worked for had always been owned um, by people in Iceland at one point, in Germany and, and Australia. So I didn't really have the kind of experience I needed today um, working with South America and uh, Asia Pacific and the Middle East and Africa and uh, both Western and Eastern Europe. So it's been quite an evolution, as you say. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, for the car rental industry, it's, as a woman, it's also kind of a male-dominated industry, So, um, and it's all over the world. So you have cultural and potentially gender issues. What are strategies that you've, you've used in that area and some of the lessons learned? Well, car rental was a very male-dominated industry, but I think as the business is changing, so is that. Uh, demographic. More and more women you see at higher levels. But when I first got here, there weren't really women, any women in the leadership roles um, to act as a mentor, to look up to, to follow their example. Um, and the company started a formal mentoring program and then assigned me to a man, and I was appalled. I was like, how is that supposed to help me? <laughs> but he did. It was amazing. Um, he had a great network of women in leadership positions all over the country, and he connected me with them. Um, and, you know, you take a little bit of advice from every person you meet. Um, there's a line in, in the musical Wicked where she says, I, I don't know if I'm better, but I know I've changed because I've met you. And I feel that way about every one of these women that I've spoken to. And as you know, you get into the compliance industry, and it, it's like one big happy family. Everybody shares. Everybody helps. 
So, you know, dealing with that has, you know, has been easier as the years have gone on. Culturally, there were some companies, it was, it, some countries rather, it wasn't quite that easy. I can remember giving a, a, a risk assessment workshop in person in India for the first time. Uh, and I had with me a, uh, a man, a consultant from, an external consultant, and he and I were in the middle of the room and we were leading the discussion. And he said to me at one point, do you realize every time you ask a question, they answer me? And I said, yeah, I see it, but it'll change. Watch. And we kept going through the day and I, you know, I, I, they needed to understand that the expert in the room, who it was, and what my purpose in being there was. And as they did, I could see the tenor changing in the room. You know, I was no longer being looked at as the woman part of the two people facilitating the workshop, but as the facilitator. So, you know, you, you just, you, you, you get through it. You, you know, you work your way through it. You continue, um, to build on the things you've learned in the past and it gets better. Yeah. And I also think the more time you spend, um, with people, um, you know, the more comfortable they get, no matter which, which gender, but particularly, you know, men in a, in a male dominated industry. My former yeah. interview was fairly male dominated. And after a while, each, you know, every time people knew I, I cared about the business, I was there to support them, men and women, you know, that became the key comfort level, but it definitely can be a challenge at first. Um, well, that's it. And, and, you know, when you come into an industry like this, uh, you know, it, it, cause. That's a man's world, you know. They know everything there is to know about cause. Uh, I happen to come from a family where we all know about cause, so I could hold my own in any conversation. It helped. Uh, and, and generally, that's what does help, is if you can speak the language the people you're working with are speaking, and your sex becomes less important. They, 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 you know, you're, you're having, you're on the same page. You have the same interest. Um, and as you say, it, it changes dramatically. The same people are now coming to me for advice and guidance. And yeah. yeah, it's funny. You reminded me of a story a long time ago for me where it was a, it, I was answering some trivia about the NFL when somebody was sure, a, a guy was sure I was wrong about it. But growing up in Buffalo, we knew our football. Um, and I oh, yeah. was right. And I had pulled him aside and he basically, you know, was thinking this girl might school me. She's trying to school me. She's wrong. But I was right. And then after that, he said, you know, I just respect that. You didn't say it in front of everybody, but you were right and I was wrong. And mm -hmm. so it, it was just a little thing. Um, and it certainly wasn't my whole life contrived, like going through the pain of being a Bills fan for that moment. But it was good. So uh, being a Bills fan, you deserve that moment. <laughs> We've been through enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to talking about that is something that it's hard to get excited and passionate about some years. But um, with you, one of the things I every time I talk to you, you've got sort of a new initiative. Um, and it's like things that you're excited and passionate about, whether it's, you know, supporting, you know, women or others in the community or something enhancing your program. And right now you, you would talk to me a little bit about two programs you had. I think it's a compliance leader program and your risk dashboard. But I really thought it was interesting how you're building those and how they work together. But I love talking about them, especially the compliance leader program. It's been something I've been trying to get the company to buy into for years. Um, but like most things, you know, the initiatives that come out of my department are generated by need. Um, car rental is a very low margin business. So um, having sufficient funding in any compliance program is a luxury. Having it in, in a non-regulated business with low margins is a challenge at best. So I've had to learn to be creative and be innovative. I don't have compliance staff in the countries we do business in. I have two people that work for me here, um, a, tra a training development person and a compliance specialist, and that's it. So as you said, we have 30,000 employees. I have uh, 28 corporate countries at this point and the rest of them are licensees, and they all need to be managed from a compliance perspective. So this compliance leader program is going to be key, and, and we're really just kicking it off. We've developed an online training curriculum for the, for the compliance leaders. We've gotten buy-in from every leader of every business unit around the world. I personally got on the phone with each one of them, introduced the program, explained why we wanted to do it, work with them to select the compliance leaders, which was the best part, because I know I've got high-caliber people in those roles. Right. And their goal, their role is really going to be twofold. They'll be the first, face a compliance locally, yes, 
Um, but simultaneously, I'm rolling out a digital risk assessment program, um, which will allow us to do all of our measurements online and, and create these unique dashboards um, where any business manager, in, you know, in, in Asia, in Europe, wherever they are, can go in and take a look at how their business looks today, what progress they're making. Um, and the system is being designed in a manner as we do the configuration that the compliance leader is the focal point in the country for both risk owners, action plan participants, um, managing the assessment process, making sure that people get it done, communicating with the local to management team, making sure they're aware of what's happening and when challenges take place, instead of them having to come to me here in the U.S. and say, well, we're at a standstill, we can't get too far, they work it out locally or then they come to us for help. And that's going to be a huge part of the role they play. Um, but one of the other challenges I've always faced is making sure that my training and policies are not too U.S.-centric or too corporate-centric. Yeah. And, and these local compliance folks are key. You really need someone in the business telling you what works for them and what doesn't work for them because the things we think, you know, from a, from a cultural perspective will fly don't work in every country. It just doesn't happen. So having them there to do that and to drive different comp compliance initiatives and uh, it's going to be really, really vital to the company. So I'm very excited. Uh, and I'm, and I'm working now on putting together recommendations for some kind of a um, recognition program for them. Yeah, I think that that's you know, great. Gonna, it, yeah, yeah, I love that because this is going to be on top of their full time job, and I want to make sure that they're recognized in some manner. Yeah, and you also mentioned that they're being recognized, but also that there is enthusiasm in the the countries to do this, which I think is great. Um, you mentioned people really, you know, feel like they're contributing and want to be a part of it, and I, you know, it looks like you've used some strategies, um, you know, in your program to get them to that point. Yeah, and you know, and, and since we've spoke previously, I've gotten a couple of emails following the invite for our first in-person meeting um, from people thanking me for picking them. I thought, you know, I had to go back to them and say, well, I actually didn't, your boss did, but um, they, they're excited, they, they want to get more involved, they want to learn more. Um, they look at it as uh, a way to improve their public profile, and it's good for their career development because they'll have a broader access to the management team. Um, broader access to people in other parts of the world. So all around, you know, there's benefits for them, and there's as much benefit as there is for my program. So I, I'm I'm confident we're going to be successful. Well, that is so cool. I I love that fact of the people doing that all over. Um, and you know, I think it also brings you know one of the things that you you know speak about fairly regularly, and it's it is bringing making your program move from good to great. And you know, like a lot of compliance officers, not only does the business change rapidly, you're trying to do this in the, I mean, the do more with less environment. I've never spoken to a compliance officer who said they were in a do more with more environment. So, Yep, that's the truth. <laughs> On the elevator this morning coming up, you know, people from different departments, and I heard one woman say, she says, I, I just, this week can't end quick enough. I just have so much to get done. And I said, so, so tell me something new. <laughs> you know, we, we're all in that. It's, it's not just compliance. It, it is the way of business today. Uh, and, and for us, it's especially challenging. We're a publicly traded company, so the shareholders expect certain financial performance. And as I say, it's a low-margin business. So if you want to make improvements, you make it by doing more with less. Um, but we got, we got really creative. You know, we've, we've changed as they've changed. As a matter of fact, uh, last year we implemented our first digital code of conduct, which was completely designed in-house. Uh, you know, I mentioned I have a training developer. She was actually, uh, uh, has an accounting degree, but between us we learned how to use the technology and we developed our own digital code. So you do learn how to do it. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing that you do. And then you keep managing to adapt. Um, and I, you know, every time I said at the beginning, but every time you speak, there's always a, a sort of a new project or initiative that is fantastic. So, um, I always love listening to that. Um, the last thing I really want to ask you before we go, and I appreciate your time is you, with your experience, um, what advice I, would you give to either women starting out or changing roles in careers? And, you know, particularly you talked a little before about something that's more male dominated, but I always love to know the things that people wish, wish they knew. Yep. 
a couple of weeks ago on the Great Woman in Compliance podcast, I think it was Stephanie Davis said, um, being the only woman in the room was actually her problem, not their problem. And I thought, I've been there. I felt that way. You know, sitting in a room full of men, wanting your voice to be heard, you know, it could go many different directions. Initially, here even, uh, I found I got strident trying to get my point across. And I realized that wasn't being effective because they just tuned me out. Um, but what I learned as I went on is that it was me that was concerned about being in the woman in the room. Once I began, you know, once I realized that the tone I had and, and I, and I scaled that back and, be, you know, and realized that they weren't shutting me out, I wasn't speaking up. And so I would say to other women, you know, don't worry about being the only woman in the room, worry about having something important to say um, being able to add value to the conversation and you'll get hurt. Yeah. I mean, I always think, you know, cho- choosing your words and asking questions and, and learning about more, particularly if you're the only compliance person in the room, the more you talk about the work people do and how to contribute, the more collaborative it is. But um, I'm sure that it's, it hasn't always been as easy to just do that as it is for you now. No, you know, like, like, you know, most type A personalities, somebody says something, you right away want to address the comments. And one of the things I've learned over the years is to sit back and wait and see how the conversation is flowing and see where it makes sense for me to weigh in. And that took time. Yeah. You know, that's experience. You learn to do that. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. So before we close out, is there anything else, you know, you, you advice or anything else you'd want to mention? Um, you know, if not, I will let you go back to your day of doing more with less. <laughs> I, I would like most of all to thank you and Mary um, for initiating these podcasts. I, I know I've said it to you, and, and uh, I listen to the podcast on my way to work in the morning, and I'm actually going back through the series now for the second time. Uh, and having a, a, a woman mentor, I think, is important. I mean, men are just as valuable, but and having the great woman in compliance podcast out there, it's like having a mentor in the call with me. And 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 when I said that, I meant it. I, I think you're contributing a tremendous amount to our community um, by showcasing women in different roles, different positions from different industries. Um, and I think that will go a long way towards helping younger women coming into our business. Um, and I hope you continue for a very, very long time because there are thousands of great women out there whose voices should be heard. Well, we are having the best time doing it. For anybody listening, I did not pay her to say that, although, you know, it would have been money well spent. <laughs> but we really appreciate it. And I can say for both Mary and for me and for, you know, Tom and the Podcast Network, the compliance in- the Corporate Compliance Insights people, every one of us, I feel like, has gotten so much more out of this than we really thought when we started because – it's, I mean, appreciate so much what everyone brings to the table and getting suggestions for people to talk. And we want, we want to do that all the time, but it's really just so cool to realize how many people are out there that are doing different things, but still have similarities and having a place to, 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 to really showcase all the great things people are doing that, you know, in the community. So thank you for being a part of it. Um, and thanks to all the listeners. And this is Lisa Fine. Take care. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.
Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.